Thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me? Yes. And thank you to Sandra for inviting Danae and I. It's really nice to come up here. I've only been to Madison once before uh, for actually a consult camp we had um, as part of our shelter medicine program. So it's nice to come back. Uh, I went to school at Tufts for veterinary school and I graduated in 2012. And then I knew I wanted to do shelter medicine, but I wanted to get some additional experience before venturing into shelter medicine. So I did an internship at the ASPCA in New York City. And uh, I don't know if any of you are heading off to an internship or what your future plans entail, but it was, uh, it really was the ideal internship for me. Uh, you rotate through everything that any other intern would rotate through, so surgery, general practice, internal medicine, emergency, um, but then you get to rotate through ASPCA's anti-cruelty unit for two months and their shelter for two months. So it was kind of the um, mixture of my favorite things, so it was <laughs> great. And then I came out right after that to UC Davis where I'm a first year resident. So if anyone has questions about future plans like that, please feel free to ask. And so what I'm going to kind of continue talking about tonight is uh, what Dr. Danae Wagner spoke about this morning. So she highlighted some of the uh, recent studies that have been done by our program and other programs about cat housing and dog housing. And what I wanted to do tonight is uh, hopefully have an interactive discussion with everyone here. So I'm really glad people showed up. Uh, <coughs> with the role of housing and the role of shelter design and facility design. And it's interesting to me because of the kind of the critical role that it has for animal welfare, and, you know, let alone everything else. So staff safety, um, just reducing cleaning time, really practical issues, but such a substantial issue as animal welfare. And so it's, I'd like to think of it as, uh, you, you know, we, I get, as part of my residency training, I go to a lot of different shelters. Like, I have to visit different shelters all over the country. And so it's really neat to be able to go from shelter and shelter to see uh, what's done good, what's still done poorly, um, kind of disseminate information all across the country, kind of be a bumblebee in some places and just kind of fly around and give people new ideas. and. They're so appreciative of it sometimes that uh, you know, it makes me very happy to be doing what I am. So let us start. Thanks. So this is where you get to talk. And just really basic, really basic. When I put these pictures up, uh, what, you know, what thoughts are provoked in you? What, what do you think of? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. No wrong answers. Never any wrong answers. Over there? Yeah. Do you think those animals came in from one house? Possibly, but probably not. Probably not. Uh, what else? The cat doesn't have any place to hide. Yeah. And so, so consequently, it looks very scared, which Dr. Wagner talked about this morning, just um, those different uh, lateral, lateral, sternal, lateral, the different stress scores you would probably <coughs> score this cat pretty high and being stressed. Um, what other concerns? Yeah, so something really basic like no bedding, right? What's up? No soft spot. Yeah. Um, for four dogs, you know, it seems like there's maybe just one food bowl and one water bowl. Um, and, and, you know, we've certainly been to shelters where uh, Chronically being understaffed is an issue, and cleaning time is usually more time that they don't have. And so often they'll go through and they'll clean, and they'll provide food and water, but they might not have the luxury, that staff member might not have the luxury to stand there and make sure that every single dog is eating out of that one bowl. So who knows if everyone's eating in that kennel, right? So, so keep those things in mind as we go through the lecture not the lecture, the discussion. And uh, so have you, have y'all heard of the five freedoms? 
Oh, I'm from Texas, so I say y'all. That's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so everyone's heard of the five freedoms. I'm sure Dr. Newberry and some of the other presenters have brought it up. Uh, and so, so the five freedoms, the role of housing, you can see when, as we go through the discussion and just in general the role of housing and how it folds into all of these freedoms. Um, from thirst and hunger, i.e. what we were just talking about in the slide before, uh, who knows if all those animals are eating in that cage because they're crowded. Freedom from discomfort, the bedding, etc. Um, pain, injury, or disease. Again, if you're, if you're a crowded shelter, you're not really sure. Um, you probably, you might not have the best monitoring system. Um, so who knows? Express normal behavior. The cat that was really scared. Uh, you know, hopefully that's no, not normal behavior. And similar, free, free uh, fear and distress. And I put up the guidelines there, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with the guidelines, because uh, you know our concept and what Dr. Newberry and so many of the pioneers in shelter medicine have worked towards was publishing these guidelines, because the next slide will show you that we have a diverse array of sheltering systems, right? Have y'all gotten a chance to, to visit many shelters? Yeah, just personally, or does, does the class get to go? Does, okay. We should. Yeah, that would be neat. Maybe next year we'll have a field trip. Yeah. Um, and so the, a part of the guidelines for, for standards is uh, you have shelters all over the country in different geographies. You have shelters in really urban areas like San Francisco, and you have this shelter in uh, rural Alabama. All right, so shelters all over, so geography is different. And, and accordingly, infectious disease could be different. Um, you could have a different cultural landscape, not, a ge not just a geographic landscape, but a cultural landscape. Um, and, and not just the physical, you can see that the physical appearance might be different between all of these shelters, but it doesn't necessarily reflect that this shelter is doing a better job of saving lives than San Francisco SPCA. Because a part of it is also uh, you have different missions. San Francisco SPCA does a lot of transferring in because they just don't have many puppies anymore. Literally, they don't have many puppies anymore <coughs> in San Francisco to, that people want to adopt and have a humane adoption. So they transfer in a lot of animals from uh, the Central Valley in California, in Northern California, to help and kind of uh, reach out and kind of be a big brother, big sister. And so their reach might be a lot larger, but this shelter, their goal might be accomplished as well, even though they're much smaller um, and seem to be in a shed. <laughs> but, you know, appearances could be different, um, missions could be different, cultural landscapes. You also have different leadership, right? S San Francisco SPCA is a private organization. This shed shelter might be uh, <laughs> under the sheriff department, right? So different hierarchies and leadership, uh, just different ways that the structure, that the organizations are structured. And then, uh, you know, so you have the outside appearance of your shelter, and you never know what you're going to find inside. You could have something really beautiful and home-like. Uh, again, uh, this really intricate <laughs> housing unit for cats, uh, but you might come into something like this. And that's not necessarily from that shed in Alabama. That could be anywhere, right? And so you could have something really home-like. You could have something that looks like the traditional pound. Uh, and the reason I put the interest, uh, the kind of the differing housing scenarios and the different sheltering systems is to bring up kind of uh, what is my purpose in speaking today? And what is it that I would like to relay to you as future veterinarians? Because I think are, are the majority of you first year, second years, third years, second year, second year, second years, okay, first years. So regardless of what you go on to do, private practitioner, emergency practitioner, if you become a shelter uh, veterinarian, shelter medicine uh, expert, um, perhaps you will hopefully think of uh, 
using some of your time for your local shelter, wherever you end up. And you might not think that uh, I'm not trained to be a shelter vet, or I'm not sure, I did <coughs> private practice for multiple years, so what, I don't know how to help. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, uh, no, so I'm actually here to say that you have, you are being trained, right? You're being trained to subjectively and objectively assess patients and assess problems. And what, uh, regardless of what you're thinking right now, you're being trained to be a problem solver. And so what we do in shelter medicine is uh, use those problem solving techniques on a bigger, kind of a bigger scale. So not just uh, applying it to one animal, but a whole shelter of animals. And so you can go in with your training and, and hopefully some really practical and useful tools as a, as a veterinarian and say, uh, this local shelter needs some help or this local shelter needs a little bit of advice because they want to renovate or they're building a new facility. And with just a, you know, a few really um, practical tools for shelter medicine and shelter facility design, uh, you can go in and help and talk to them about capacity or talk to them about uh, flow through the shelter and how to ensure that they aren't moving from sick animals to healthy animals, that they're always moving from healthy to sick. Uh, you can maybe talk to them a little bit about noise reduction. You can talk to them about um, what we learned today about cat housing in space. Uh, you can talk to them about double-sided compartments for dogs and cats and why that's useful. So, so many of these things that we aren't otherwise learning in vet school necessarily, or at least across the country we aren't. You are, because y'all are great, but uh, it's, you know, it's not really on everyone's radar. Um, and certainly it might not be on um, private practitioners' radar. And so as you graduate, you can use those tools, hopefully, and go in and help your local shelter. Even if it's for only a little bit, uh, an hour or two a week, whatever it might be. Okay. So what I wanted to start with, though, is just some blueprints of shelters because uh, Dr. Danae Wagner does, oh, thank you, uh, she is uh, our, our master planner and she is uh, going to talk to you a little bit about blueprints and what to think about when you consider blueprints with intake, capacity, going through the shelter, um, not just the animals walking through the shelter, but humans walking through the shelter, etc. Thank you. I'm just going to, my goal isn't to um, make you a shelter uh, consultants for design, but it's just to understand some of the things we're looking at when we look at um, facility designs. And I'm actually going to advance it on to a larger facility, and then I'll come back to this other more easily to understand one. But this is a facility, this is in um, Colorado Springs, this is Pikes Peak Humane Society, and they came to us um, requesting some help in remodeling their facility. This is the, their main entrance into their adoption lobby, and um, these guys, their intake is, I believe, around 18,000 a year, so this is a big facility. You notice all their dog housing in this back area. Um, and they're making, this facility right now is not big enough to handle the capacity that they have. So they're doubling up in a lot of their areas. This is all dog adoption, uh, mostly co-housed, uh, especially for the smaller breeds. So that's happening in here. Um, this is all their cat adoption area. They've repurposed some storage areas like this for um, cat isolation. They've done all kinds of kind of crazy things trying to get the flow through just to work for them and they continue to change this, this setup. Um, this isn't the easiest setup because what this is then, they had an architect come in um, and plan on this area would all be intake housing, so cat housing would be in here, and dog housing in here. What happened um, was that uh, Dr. Hurley and I visited Pikes Peak probably uh, two months ago, six weeks ago, yes, something like that, and we um, visited the facility that as it's set up right now, 
and identified some of their um, main concerns, which is actually has a lot more to do with management of the facility than the, the current space. They are very <laughs> short on dog housing. We went through their data and dis, um, discovered that definitely short on housing for dogs and priority for them when they do a remodel is to make sure that they build dog housing. So that be, because of all the um, co-housing that's going on, we'd really like to see them be able to house one dog per kennel. Um, they actually have, I told you about that um, this, uh, this after, or around uh, the noon lecture about the housing that looked like it was being really noisy, but it ended up not being noisy. Well, it's this housing right here. Um, pretty narrow space to move around in there. These kennels are really close. They're, they're probably only three feet apart. But these are all glass, glass viewing areas. So um, these dogs have some visual stimulation. They have double compartment, double sided kennels so they can eliminate away from their bed. Um, and they just, there's a lot going on in there. They can quiet down and rest. And when we were there, that these rooms, when we went into them, I thought they would be really noisy, but they weren't. And I think part of it, I think a big part of it was that their knees were being met. They had the basic housing that they needed. And they weren't isolated. They, were, they could see each other. They were being cared for. There was a lot of um, traffic, people going up and down the, the um, hallways, the aisles in here. And so it wasn't a completely boring sort of place to be. These guys, volunteers, were walking them and just lots going on. So I was really surprised because when, when I first looked at that, I thought, mm, that's not going to be good. But it, it actually was adequate for what they needed at, for that time. <clears throat> the other thing was that they were housing a lot more cats than what they really need, their adoption-driven capacity. They were way above the, their adoption-driven capacity. All the housing in here was chucked full of cats. Um, and what they needed to do was just manage their cat population, try to get their cat numbers um, down. So that the length of stay on these guys was approaching 30 days in the shelter, and that's just too long for these guys being here. With that long length of stay, the great majority of these cats went through, spent time in isolation, had upper respiratory infection, and went through the um, isolation sort of area. Um, so the proposed uh, cat adoption area, actually the architect did a great job on this. He's got, and you can't see it here and I apologize, but he put in some group rooms, some individual rooms where people can walk in and, and the cat can be housed um, singly or, or co-housed if they're bonded pair or whatever, and then has some kind of cage housing in the adoption area. So that part was really nice and we we're encouraging them to continue to kind of plan for that. Um, but the, having all the cat intake over here and the other cat housing over here, we w recommended that instead of going and building all of this, to go ahead, get your cat population, manage your cat population, separate it into two tracks. One are the cats going on the track for adoption, and then the other track of cats being the cats that either go to off-site adoption, or neuter and return, or cats that will be euthanized. And separate those two populations, um, the cats that are not going to uh, adoption in this facility will be housed separately. In group housing, we actually decided that some of the kennels that they were using um, for some of their dogs could be repurposed and used for group housing for cats. And then the, the rest of the housing would be used for cats on the pathway to adoption. So um, in, a, in a nutshell, we told them that they didn't need to build this um, huge addition. In fact, just build the dog housing but move it up into the front. Continue to do intake here. Um, when they get this new facility built, do all their intake here, but then walk the cats that will be housed here or up here so that the cats basically stay in the same part of the facility and we don't get kind of cross 
exposure from cats and dogs trying to minimize stress. And the dogs intake um, will be here as well, but we won't need to be, build this whole, whole piece here. Repurpose some of these areas for transfer dogs. And, um, and hopefully in saving some mo money here, they've got a clinic that is in bad need of remodeling. Um, they need to do uh, a lot of surgeries. And the way it's set up right now, they really can't do it. But there's space there. So we're hoping we can save some of this money and they can put it into their surgical facility and, and be able to do that. But this, um, right now we have probably uh, 70 hours in consultation with these guys. So the visit, all the looking at their um, capacity, their data, trying to help them um, suss out their information and make the best decisions that they will. We're probably talking about an $8 million remodel on this facility, so yeah. What you're doing essentially like this is kind of a almost off topic question. How do you convince them that going from two bigger building while they're on an intake of 18,000 that they can increase from that 18,000 to another number to keep overstocking and overfilling the shelter? Because they're trying to, or are they doing the remodel just to be able to fill and feed that capacity without going over? Uh, that, that's a great question. So I, how do you build for, do you mean? Uh, like what they have right now, you take 18,000, do you want to build for the intake they have right now, or do you want to build for like, yeah. say they want to start intaking like 20,000, 22,000? That is a great question. And this is something that comes up quite frequently. And the, the number one thing that um, we struggle to, um, get to a compromise on is the size of the facility that's going to be built. And a lot of people feel like as you go and build a facility that's going to last 50 years, that that means that in 50 years, the intake is going to be a lot more than what it is right now. And then there, there are some instances where it, it may be more and we need to plan for more. But in many instances, what we're also um, sharing with them is that we need to implement programs to reduce intake at the same time you're planning for the future. And this is critical to, because we can't, we cannot serve all the animals that just show up at the door, so to speak, or we can't think that a facility is gonna um, be able to operate if people just bring more and more animals to it. The facility does have um, a capacity but there are some things that we can do as far as managing that facility that are really important to the um, functionality of that, that facility and the ability to handle more animals. And do you guys have, um, anybody have a, a thought on what that might be? It's, a, it's pretty much, it's the backbone of kind of a lot of things is it has to do with um, animal health and shelters. It's a critical component of um, cost of operation. It has to do with the animals. Length of stay. Length of stay. This, so if we have a shelter that's got um, an average length of stay for um, a cat of 45 days, 40 days, and um, that affects the housing what we can do with the housing numbers there and how many cats we can serve in that facility. Um, if we can have that length of stay to 20, we can serve twice as many animals. And this is how we need to think for the future for a lot of facilities is we'll, we design a, like if we get into a, into a work with a group of, um, that's got very long length of, of stay for their animals, Unless there, and, and there are certain situations where we might, they're doing, they're not doing kind of a traditional sheltering where we're trying to get them in and get them back out. That might be a new, unique situation, but the most of the shelters we're working with, we want short lengths of stay for animal health and well-being so the facility can operate um, um, within their budget. And we develop um, capacities that have some flexibility in this length of stay. 
so that if they're, be, if they're able to manage from, if you can take it down from a 14 day length of stay down to a 10 day length of stay, your, your ability to serve more animals has increased dramatically. So when we talk about capacity, there's housing numbers. You have a, a set housing number, but that can flex to meet the needs of the community in a different way in, um, through length of stay, how long those animals are staying there on average. And so the tighter the sh you can run the ship, actually the more animals you can serve. And so that's our, that is a key component of, of thinking about the future and how we want to approach um, capacity, shelter capacity, <coughs> so really through management of length of stay. And there's some other things we'll do with talking about flexible use of housing space, probably the most um, fluctuation in animal numbers that we see is on the cat side right now. We see some fluctuation in dog, but the intake tends to be pretty consistent throughout the year in most shelters. There may be some that are uh, somewhat inconsistent, but we don't see the seasonality that we see in cats. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I won't go into right now. But that's our most um, challenging population. We can go from 100 to 200 or 200 to 400 and have to try to figure out how we can deal with that um, change in population. Um, but that's an excellent question. And in addition to what Danae is saying also that while there is a there is a pretty strong national trend for intake to be declining in most cities, um, we also know that there is a really strong trend when shelters upgrade and especially if they build a new building um, that often is like, oh, let's bring our animals there. Um, so we definitely, you know, there is this strong trend for decreasing intake, but building a new shelter almost inevitably means more people will bring you their animals, especially if you don't have some sort of plan for how to mitigate that effect. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. In fact, that's critical to designing the, like the facility. Um, we talk about adoption, to it, adoption driven capacity and trying to get that number in, in the adoption area such that um, we don't, and, um, so we do a, a calculation. To, seen it. Have you guys oh, seen it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So we'll do a calculation to figure out the number of animals that we want in that based on that shelter's um, historical adoption, and we can, uh, it can be flexible to some point, but it really addresses that putting the right number of animals on the, on the floor, and it also addresses this length of stay issue that we run into quite often. So definitely, and some of the things we talked about, how animals are presented, some of the cats, by putting them in the housing that presents them in the best possible way, allows interaction to occur, um, some of those things also go into the design, as well as how that adoption area is set up um, and, and the type of housing that's in there. So definitely, um, when we'll take, we may take 20 hours looking at the data that the shelter has shared with us, and we'll usually look at about three years of data and try to get some idea of what's happening within that community's kind of shelter will also talk with the shelter and the, the um, parties that are uh, working with the shelter, the rescue groups, the, the people that are um, providing care, uh, what type of, uh, if they have foster programs set up, really everything, as much as we can gather information about what they have for resources in that community so that we can better calculate what, what their needs are going to be, and it's different community to community. Um, so, a lot of a lot of time at the computer goes in before we come back and sort of give them uh, thoughts and ideas. And we can look at 
we will take a, a like sometimes we just get a diagram like this and they'll ask for um, feedback on things that we will see from that and that is puts us at a little disadvantage because we don't know their needs as far as capacity and numbers and that has such a huge effect on how that facility is going to operate that it, it's not our um, we prefer not to go in at that route because it just leaves us without knowing enough to make good choices in a design. But, um, and a lot of money goes in at this point. This is what they'll be dealing with you know, for the next 50 years or whatever. And so we're putting all that time and effort in at the front ends becomes really important. And this reminds, so I always uh, think of this one comment that uh, uh, a kennel staff member in a mobile shelter said, and he said something like, man, when they built this shelter, they didn't think of how many stray dogs there are in Mobile County. And, and kind of his concept, what he was, I think, trying to relay to me was that uh, they clearly didn't build enough space for all of the stray dogs here, which if you think about that, uh, that is probably impossible to do anyways. Um, and so, but sometimes the concept is, oh, if we have more space and if we just had more cages, we could keep taking, taking, taking. Um, but what that all also reminds me of is, uh, you know, you have a shelter and it has these, this arbitrary number of cages in it. And so it's always, you know, important to think, is that really your capacity, this arbitrary number that the shelter was built with maybe like 20 years ago? Because it's not. Right, your capacity isn't just based on physical space. It's based on your staff, and it's based on length of stay, and it's based on uh, daily care, and how much you can provide for daily care. So there's a lot more than just the physical space, which is often an arbitrary number. Um, except some of these newer projects that Dr. Danae uh, Wagner, Dr. Hurley, and a bunch of other team members work on, where we try to recommend using adoption-driven capacity and designing based on that. And then this, this one, this blueprint might be easier for you to, to kind of go through because it's color coordinated. And this is a private shelter in Berkeley. And it's, these are the proposed blueprints. So it's, it hasn't been made yet. Um, but what's important to note is that this shelter has an intake of about 1,000 animals per year. So very different from Pikes Peak, which was 18,000. Uh, this shelter also has no um, municipal contracts, so they're not animal control for any surrounding areas or for Berkeley. Um, what they're interested in and what they primarily do now is they transfer in. So similar to San Francisco SPCA that I, was mentioned, that I mentioned earlier, they're uh, helping sister shelters and sister communities and they're trying to bring in more adoptable animals into their community. And so uh, Dr. Wagner was it is it about 800 200 the breakdown cat dog and cat actually oh, I think it's I think it's around um, their goal was they upped their goal for the number of animals that they were going to serve it was around a thousand dogs and I think it's 800 cats Oh, it's my switch. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and so when Dr. Wagner and Dr. Hurley started working on this project, they a part of the beginning of consult projects are we send out a really detailed questionnaire and um, to discuss intake, what their historical intake is for animals, but then also to discuss what Dr. Wagner was uh, talking about is uh, what's the kind of the population dynamics in the human community there? Are you projected to grow? Are you, um, if you're in California or if you're in Pikes Peak, Colorado, are you projected to have any natural disasters that, that could um, be important to take into account when, you need, when you're designing a shelter? Do you need, i.e., flex space for animals that might be coming in for a disaster? So there are, there's a really thorough questionnaire that we ask people to fill out or shelters to fill out so that we can provide them with the best um, advice. And so some of the concepts that I wanted to mention here is uh, since this facility is primarily transferring in, they don't have to deal with a legal stray hold because 
the animals are coming from another shelter where they've gone through their stray hold. So you don't technically have to really worry about uh, stray hold and um, pre-adoption areas. You might not have to. But what this shelter does is they impose their own um, hold period for maybe because they're bringing in animals from high-risk areas. So they're, they're, they're imposing their own kind of quarantine period. And so that's interesting, and that, that dictates part of the shelter design. Um, they also, the next picture I believe, not when we go on, go, go for it. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Um, another topic I wanted to touch on was the lobby. So the lobby's here, and so it's, it's interesting to me um, because we, we took this into account, you know, do you really need a huge lobby if you don't have a lot of people coming in surrendering animals? Um, but you might need a big lobby for a lot of potential adoption. So also important to take into account size of lobby, just because often space, especially in an urban environment like this, is restricted. Um, other things to think about are when people come through the front door, how are they going to go through your shelter? And so here what Dr. Uh, Wagner was explaining to me is that people can come through the front door, public entry, and head down this way and just walk pretty readily along this uh, inner perimeter here or this inner walkway here and walk through all of the dogs. And then that likely there would be, they'd have to probably put up uh, a door here so that people couldn't go into the back or into isolation back here. But it's also important to think about human pathways and animal pathways. And then that got me thinking of, this is interesting, here is our hospital. And if I advance, you'll see that the second story is where they have cat adoption, but the first story has cat isolation here next to the hospital. And so I was asking Dr. Wagner about that, and they, um, I believe that it wasn't recommended to do that, is that correct? Yeah, it was a preference on their part. They wanted cat isolation connected right onto the clinic, and the way it's set up probably isn't ideal, but it meets their their desires for that. And it, it, you definitely want isolation separated from your general population, but oftentimes it's nice to have kind of all the all the cats together at one place, with isolation being um, a separate a separate room. But they separated it as well from the, the main population, which is upstairs. So I, I don't think it's terrible. It's just make sure that they don't forget the cats in isolation or downstairs. And also, moving cats, they'll have to take a sick cat that's upstairs, downstairs, if, they, if they're getting sick there, which we're hoping that the hoping housing that right. design there will help prevent that. But yes. Uh, another thing is here, they have a big indoor dog exercise area. And I, I believe a part of that the concept there is to do like a big meet and greet, like a, a people, potential adopters can come and bring the animals out. Uh, but interestingly, Dr. Wagner was explaining to me that this is uh, open to the second story. So it's not contained within the first story. And so um, when, you, when you recognize that the cats are housed upstairs, and some of the cats might be housed downstairs for isolation, that, that might not be uh, the most um, stress reducing planning so uh, but again we work with what their preferences are and what they have so and I'll just add in here is not so some architects or some of the architects that we've worked with have been um, designing shelters for a long period of time and others are brand new to the field and this particular group that is designing this shelter is brand new to the field so sometimes things that we take for granted with architects that have worked with animal shelters, um, designing animal shelters, um, it, uh, there's a lot more time and education that goes into um, working with an architectural group that hasn't spent any time. There's so many shelter-specific des des designs that need to be incorporated in this whole thing. I just talked with these guys um, last week about this um, concern about noise um, percolating upstairs where our cats and were, the, the whole de the design was that to really separate the dogs and cats to ensure the cats had a nice quiet area. And 
that concept just wasn't, it, um, it was new to them as far as that, that kind of information. And so um, working with um, people that are unfamiliar with the, the concepts of animal sheltering and kind of the overview of what we want to achieve and why we're doing what we're doing can be, um, uh, can take a lot more time with, with people that are unfamiliar. At the same time, some of the people that have been working with shelters for a long time will continue to do the same thing over and over, even, you know, that's what they're familiar with. So then we'll see the same, sometimes the same missteps or, or issues that need to be addressed that aren't addressed, that, that are, they're doing it over and over. But um, so it's a learning process either way. Yeah. So um, it might be stretching you guys a little bit, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on what do you think are like, the good things and bad things about having the cat housing upstairs? That's great. Mm -hmm. any, issue, any issues that you can think of as far as what one might encounter um, program, program in, you know, in a program or... Like, so why would you not want to put the cat housing upstairs in the shelter? If you have people that are just like coming in the front door to just like browse around, what's the likelihood that they're going to go upstairs if they didn't come specifically looking for a cat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they might miss them. They're sort of tucked away and hidden. And that's one thing that we really, um, when we're designing facilities, we really like to put the cats right up front so they cannot be missed. Because that's kind of contrary, right? Like, so cats, in general, have a little bit more difficult um, time getting released a lot. So in general, if you go from shelter to shelter, dog life release rates go up before cat life release rates. So you're taking the more difficult to adopt group and putting them more out of the way, which isn't really what you want to do. Is there an elevator in this? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, uh, they have to be ADA. All the all new structures have to be ADA compliant. And there's some other things that uh, size of aisleways and um, public areas that all go into that too. But I let the architects take care of it. Are the cats being brought downstairs or the elevator? Are they brought downstairs? There. So there's like when, they're, like, when, when they're leaving them up there. Right. Yeah. Or like when they're taken up there or coming down. Because I would think that the elevator. That there may be so, yeah there may be some cats that do not appreciate the elevator ride, but there is st stairway, and I don't know exactly how their um, what their main um, way to get upstairs. I, I I'm guessing that it will be stairs. Uh, but it's a good it's a, a good point because when uh, I was working at the ASPCA in New York City, we you know we have no um, floor we don't have much floor space right horizontal space, but we have vertical space because the ASPCA's building is I think five or six stories with a basement and a sub-basement and then, oh, if, have you been there? Or has anyone oh, been no. there? Oh, no, I have okay. Society in Chicago. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. And so um, you have dogs housed on the first floor, but also the third floor. And then you have cats on the third floor, but then also two different parts of the basement. And so they their rules there are, you can only move animals through the elevators. They have stairs, of course, but I think just because of safety issues, especially with dogs going up and down the stairs, um, the rule is always that every animal has to be transported through the elevators there, which is very time consuming, but potentially safer. But in New York, you really have to get your dog to get to be used to the elevator because there are elevators everywhere. And the people are probably more used to looking for things under them. The yeah. interesting thing about this facility is this: that it's basically on the. Um, it has to fit into the same structure as their old facility, so they were really confined for space, and hence they went into a two-story two-story um, model, and there was no way to put cats and dogs on that first floor and hit their capacity needs or help uh, meet their capacity needs. Our first um, suggestion was to put some cat adoption, though, on the first floor, right in the corner of right here. Put some cat adoption here. And, and 
the cool yeah. thing is that the housing that's in here is small dog housing, puppy housing. This could be used for cats too. So we still have the possibility. Um, right now it's designed for small dog housing, but um, there it's an enclosed room and they could get cats into these areas should they decide they want to do that in the future. So we haven't balked too much about that. There's some potential flexible use of this space. This is <clears throat> just a high traffic corner. And this would be just great for cats, but right now it's small dog housing and we all compromise on um, things that we, we see. There's a lot of good stuff going on and there's potential here for them to be flexible in that housing space. So. Yeah, that'd be nice if, if there are windows. There are windows to the outside, right? Yep, there's windows there's to the outside perfect. so people can kind of look in. It doesn't, right. um, which um, sometimes we're a little concerned about when the animals don't, when they don't have, when they're in complete view and kind of have no place to retreat. But the architects were really good about <coughs> designing that so that they can look in. Um, these are double compartment housing units. Part of it you can look in, and then the other part is they can use for retreat. So it's nicely set up that way. The ASPCA in New York has that as well, where you walk by the facade and um, and they have a big, a really big, nice, uh, small, uh, not, not too many, sorry, uh, cat, like group housing for cats. And so you can walk by and the cats are interacting with each other and playing and people love that. And then um, around the holidays, they send, SFSPCA sends animals to Macy's in downtown and they put them in the Macy's windows <laughs> and they like their adoptions skyrocket. They have about 400 adoptions yeah. a, a, seat, like um, a year from those Christmas windows. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if you thought that the reason the Berkeley people were reticent about putting cats in there is because they think the dogs have more like full value in the window. Is that what you're trying to achieve there? Or is it just they the certainly animals? have more adoption room on the dog side of things. Like they could adopt a lot adopt out a lot more dogs. They have just a lot more that way. And they they needed more dog housing. So um, that's sort of the, the direction they're going. They though Their plan is to continue to adopt out the same number of cats, but they're really hoping that they can, and if they can get the dogs in there, they will be able to adopt out more dogs. Their limiting factor is getting dogs in. Like They are scrounging to get dogs. Yeah. And so over here, too, you'll see that this is all flex. So what Dr. Wagner was pointing out, and even up here, this is all flex housing for um, maybe medical cases or uh, families like bitches with litters, whatever it might be. So they've certainly planned a lot for their dog housing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but before we move on, any other questions about just blueprints and trying to set up a shelter to meet the future needs of a community? It's kind of a big topic, but I yeah. wanted to touch on it. I think you know one of the most useful things we do is when we get a blueprint or have someone that we, um, we want to talk to them about what their what their ideas are for that for that shelter that they're planning is we have them walk us through the facility like you're bringing an animal in yeah. or you're adopting out an animal. Show us how that animal is going to move through that facility. And that is one of, uh, it's just a really basic thing we can do and it helps us identify issues. Maybe they haven't noticed that they're gonna take the cats through do the dog housing area to get them over to surgery or you know something on that. So we have them go through the flow um, that an animal is gonna, when they arrive and the flow that they're gonna do when they leave. And that can be really helpful just getting a, a good idea of what, what's gonna happen with, within that facility. How do you decide, or when do you decide, whether retrofitting or remodeling would actually be worth it versus trying to find a place to build an all-new facility? That, that's a great question. We aren't often involved in that decision. The architects <coughs> and the shelters, it, it tends to be a budgetary. Sometimes there's opportunities within a community where land is available, um, maybe a municipal shelter, and the city's going to give them some, some land probably next to the to the sanitary land. No, <laughs> well, oftentimes that's the way it has been. But sometimes there's opportunity for land um, which may make a, a new building uh, cheaper. Some of the remodeling, like the remodeling on that um, Colorado Springs shelter that they're proposing is really, it's really expensive. Ideally, they, 
they would like to just have a no, whole new facility. So there's, if you could tell, there's a lot of issues with that facility, existing facility, and remodeling it may help some, but it's not going to fix a lot of existing issues. So um, it really depends on the money available, opportunities available. Sometimes you can get more money donated for a new building than you can for a remodel. It really depends what's going going on. So, um, a good question. And you see, well, on that differences between like a larger city, say San Francisco, versus like a smaller, maybe say like Green Bay or some of the final like some of the dash that city. It's when it comes to building or remodeling. Is it easier to almost get a new building? In I don't know, Sandra, maybe, do you have any feel on that? It, it really I think, I, you know, I, I think the big, one of the biggest issues when they're trying to figure out a location is access. And so, like, Pause Chicago is actually a really good example of a, of a choice that's been made where they have their intake facility is actually on 18th Street in Chicago in a, in an area that's a mildly at-risk neighborhood, at least mildly at-risk neighborhood, and they, um, and it's cheap rent for them, and it's the biggest of their facilities, and then they have a very upscale adoption center that's much smaller in a very upscale neighborhood um, that is probably their biggest donor base, and also probably their biggest adoption base. So there are two facilities, and they actually move in almost between the two facilities. Um, so that's, that's a good example, and I think there's a lot of other, the, the sort of off-site adoption center has uh, become pretty popular in terms of a way of trying to maximize life saving capacity for shelters that already have a large facility. Um, you know, the Chicago Municipal Shelter is in an area where there aren't a lot of homes, um, so there are some, but you know, it's just, it's difficult get to from other parts of the city and um, even Dayton County the main city here is not an easy place to get to if you want to adopt an animal. Most people, lots of people I should say, in Madison are really used to driving around, but if you want to get there on public transportation, it's very, very difficult. Um, so they, you know, they've got a West Side Adoption Center now and have definitely looked at having, you know, different things and more accessible places. Does that answer what you're talking about? Thank you. Okay. One more thing. Um, oh, please. Sorry. So Toronto Humane Society is another really interesting one that's just coming up. So they have a, a shelter, a nice shelter. It's been there for a really long time, but the value of the land that their shelter is on has gotten incredibly high because of where it is. Boston ARL is another one where mm -hmm. it's like in this oh. unbelievable piece of, of property and both of those shelters are thinking of, you know, wow, is there a way that like, could we sell the land, yeah. use that money some other way? And there was one point where ARL was even thinking about, like, could they have a building built on top and have the shelter in the building that got built? Um, so there's all, there's all sorts of different ways of approaching it. Yeah, same with, uh, we were just at SFSPCA, and they have mm -hmm. a building that they haven't used in a while, and they're thinking of, of selling it, and they probably would get a lot of money from it, but yeah, just yeah. some of the some of these city locations, some of these places where the shelters have been for a long while, um, their value has increased tremendously beyond um, beyond expectations. And if they can sell that property, often rebuild and either have money left over for programs and different stuff like that. So they there's a lot of things that need to go into play prior to and deciding what's going to be best for a, a, a community or group. And it really depends on where, what's, what's up in their community, what's happening. Great questions. So we'll zip along. Go, oh, please. Oh, go for it. No, keep going. We're going to go through that. Um, and then we're just going to talk a little bit about specific considerations. And we've touched upon a lot of this already. But uh, just to, again, make it more interactive and, and to speak about particular um, topics. So 
The first one I put up here is Lobby Design, and this is SFSPCA. It's a really beautiful, very, um, you know, think of like, think of first impressions. Like you come in here and it's beautiful, it's colorful, it smells good, it's not loud. Um, it's a pleasant place to be. And there's so many uh, perspectives you can take on when you enter a shelter, right? You can think of its role, like what is its role in the community? It's hopefully saving lives, um, concerned with public safety, uh, but you can also think of it from the perspective of it. it's a business as well. And so you walk in and this is a really nice and welcoming place. Um, and, and I think that they, they utilize their lobby really well because they just always have a constant flux of people. And it's not just the doctors, but it's uh, uh, volunteers, people coming and going for different outreach projects that they have. Um, another shelter that I, we recently went to with a, a, a pretty large just area, walkway area and lobby was uh, Humane Valley, uh, no, Silicon Valley's Humane Society. And while we were visiting there, there was a group of corporate volunteers. So nowadays there are these great um, projects that a lot of these big companies do where they let their, not their entire staff, but part of their staff leave um, early or take a part of their work day to just go volunteer at a shelter. And so just a lot of um, flow through the shelter. And so it's good to keep in mind when you're designing or renovating um, <coughs> with, do I have, am I just going to be transferring in a lot of animals? Uh, do I need space for a lot of owner surrenders? Um, do I have space to, to separately delineate intake from adoptions? Because that's nice too. Um, so uh, concepts like that. Uh, and then I wanted to touch upon the different facets and different kind of that Dr. Wagner was talking to me about kind of the top 10 uh, probably most critical issues when considering design and housing. And so one of them that everyone knows, of course, I'm sure, is separation of species. So um, what I put up here is uh, very clearly the, these animals are mixed here. And here, it might be difficult to see, but this is, I should say first, that this is their actual office space that they've, they're housing animals in. So the office is right here, where you would adopt and surrender animals is, is literally right here. Uh, so they're above capacity, likely. Um, and this is cat, some cat housing, cats that are adopt for, up for adoption. And these are puppies in this X pen. And then over here, I'm sorry you can't see in the picture I took, but there are more puppies here and there are more cats here. And so um, you've probably learned about why separation of species is important, but could uh, someone reiterate why? Or some of the reasons why? What? Stress equals herpes. Stress, yeah. What else? Disease. Disease transmission. Other ideas? But yeah, stress, disease, uh, noise, etc. And so um, the next picture I put up here is it's hard to see, but I took a close up shot of this cat that was in the same room as these 10 puppies, I believe. And we were there doing a little mini consult for a few hours that day, and I never saw this cat move. So it was just hiding in the back of its area, or in the back of its cage, kind of in its crumpled um, blanket back here. But this cat was stressed. And uh, the people at the shelter just didn't notice. And so one of our recommendations from that consult, even though we weren't consulting particularly on housing, was of course, um, per the, the guidelines that, that um, ASV has written, you know, always try to separate always separate a species. And this, I use this actually also as a segue into other techniques that um, shelters can use to reduce noise. Yes, I have please. a question about separation of species. I was wondering if you have any recommendations for separation of special species? Because I know for a lot of shelters yeah. that take in special species, it's like dogs, cats, and then a room for everything else. Yeah. Um, 
which is really stressful when you have like a monastery staring at hamsters and things. And I went to a shelter where the rabbits were in the middle of the cavern. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's obviously stressful when you have everything together, when you have, you know, snakes with mice and all that sort of stuff. But I've also even read that having rats near mice or rats near hamsters can be stressful. So I was wondering if you have any insight. And yeah, we've certainly seen, so not specifically like rats with hamsters, I'm not sure Dr. Newberry, Dr. Wagner might see, but yes, uh, um, I've also, we've also seen, I've also been to shelters where the small mammals were housed in the middle of the cat housing area, and that's certainly stressful, but anything specifically about Just separation of prey species, and I'll say that, but sometimes what we end up seeing is we have one small mammal room and so we really don't have appropriate housing for it. We can house some animal, small mammal, in this room, but we might not be able to house all the small mammals. So really having a plan in place so when that small mammal comes in that we don't have appropriate housing for, we can move those guys into, you know, identify places where those guys can be moved to. Um, our local shelter used to take in every single rabbit that showed up at the front door and we just didn't have the housing, appropriate housing for these rabbits. But the rabbit rescue group would usually take the rabbits after about two months in the shelter. And so instead of waiting for the two months, you know, before the rescue group came and stepped in, the shelter just said, hey, we, we just got a rabbit in, can you guys come pick it up? And it's out of there within 24, 48 hours. And, and so identi identifying the shelter's ability to care for these animals is really a big part of, of, of um, providing housing. And then if small mammals are a really big part of, of this particular um, facility, then setting up appropriate housing to kind of accommodate the needs for that um, should be done. So we, I approach it more in, you know, in existing facilities is really trying to do more outreach, getting, getting those animals out of there if we don't have appropriate housing for them. One of the, this is a, a place where a length of stay comes in to play hugely to sort of look at capacity for care and also capacity for site release. Um, and one of my favorite examples when we did a consultation in Toronto was they used to have so many small mammals and um, exotic species too. And we actually, I talked with them about sort of looking at what their really, what their adoption capacity really was. and. I think this is true with cats as well, but I, it was easier to make the argument with the people there who were really interested in trying to adopt out all these small mammals, especially to say, you know, shouldn't you really be the model for how cool and how fun it can be to house these animals in your house? So instead of showing all these rats and mice and hamsters in like little tiny aquariums telling people, but we don't think you should house them this way. It's kind of like cats, right? Like if, yeah. you, if somebody went into a shelter and said, like, saw, you know, your two by two stainless cage and was like, oh, what a great idea. <laughs> I'm going to do that at home. I've got a perfect cabinet for this cat, right? Nobody would like that. And so in Toronto, like, they bought into this. And what they did is they created model housing for those kind of animals in their small animal room. So they redid their whole small animal room. And it's super fun going into their small animal room now. They have like, I don't know, maybe a fifth or a tenth of the animals that they used to have at any given time. They're still um, helping just as many, I think more animals because they're, that room is pretty popular now because they do like all these double, triple stacker um, cages and they they use like care fresh bedding so it's like two or three deep and all the rodents and the hamsters and stuff build all these tunnels in it and you can see them in their tunnels and you watch and they're popping up and they do they go through all these tubes and all this other stuff so it's like wow that's a really fun pet not just like a castaway of an animal that we didn't really have a good place to put anywhere and so they really changed that whole presentation and I think changed the possible outcomes and the level, you know, the level of welfare for sure in doing that. And so it was actually, I mean, it was a great opportunity to kind of talk with them about why are you even doing this? Yeah. And, and you know, what are you trying to achieve in doing it? Yes.
So I would just go back to Toronto as my example, just because they're the first shelter for me that actually did the things I wanted them to do for the small animals. And what I find, you know, we have a rat, I don't know if we've discussed, but in our rat, actually, I mean, he's a really social rat, and if we're up and around and doing stuff during the day, so is he. And um, and I think that it's partly, you know, people don't, we don't consult on this issue in shelters very often, but I think providing enrichment and entertainment and activity and interaction during the day makes those animals more daytime oriented and less nocturnal. But I, I've never seen a shelter really go into that. I've never seen a shelter like try to show a green red light or anything like that. But it would be cool if one did. And I, I think this is an excellent point with your interests in these species and the knowledge that you personally have. Yes. I mean, I personally can barely keep up with the things we're, we're trying yeah. to keep up yeah. with and, and really tapping into the knowledge that you have and, and being able to share that um, with groups that you might be working with you know, in the future and realize that you have some, you know, each one of you have interests and knowledge um, that uh, maybe you will be able to use in, in certain situations. And so certainly, you know, how the, the housing needs of these special species, and, and et cetera, um, use it to your best advantage and, and help and can help out. And realize the help you can do by doing that. I mean, seriously, that's a great project idea. Somebody last year did a follow-up project on chicken intake yeah. into animal shelters. And it's a great. huge issue. I mean, especially in Madison, because, you know, now there's a new Yeah, yeah the chickens are coming in. This is you know? big. And we're, yeah, yeah we exactly. haven't planned for any chicken housing in any of our current facilities, you know. Yeah, but like now the chickens are coming. And so, yes. But it, it seems, you know, but, and so if it, there are animals that you care about and you care about the way they're treated in shelters, try to start making recommendations for them for the project together. And, you know, if anyone is interested in further training, the nice part, uh, or one of the nice parts, of residency training is I get to rotate through our UC Davis hospital. So for instance, I just rotated through our CAPE service, so um, avian and exotics. And um, and to you know kind of refresh and recap on um, all of these husbandry issues that are pertinent to small animals that we don't usually, I mean, otherwise I don't get too much experience at most of the shelters I travel to. Um, so it's, it's nice to get those refreshers as well. Yeah, a nice training. mix of kind of out in the field and then, you know, yeah. what's going on at the university as far as specialty stuff. So cool. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, in academia, there's so many opportunities. That we, a few months ago, we did a, um, participated in a whole parrot welfare workshop. So, so many different opportunities. Um, very lucky to be there. But I am. I really like it there. Um, so. What I wanted to talk about here was other ways to reduce noise. Um, some, some things are really simple, like these uh, plastic latches that just the sound doesn't resonate as at, um, at a kind of as an, an, of an annoying of a pitch, and it's not as loud. Um, I remember, and you might have similar experiences, but the first shelter I went to during vet school that um, it hadn't even been populated yet. They were they had just finished building it, and it was in uh, it was in Rhode Island, and it's called Potter League. I don't know if anyone has been there, um, but it's a it's a it is a very beautiful shelter. It's uh, LEED, I think, gold certified, um, really beautiful. And one of the things that they made sure they did in their planning process was to put acoustical plaster on walls and siding. Um, they also did acoustical ceiling tiles. Um, we can talk about this later, but they also did a lot of plexiglass housing because that can contain noise as well, although there are some downsides with the adoption interaction with that. Um, and then other things that I have noticed in other shelters I've been to is Dr. Wagner had talked about this as well, um, multiple areas for exits, especially in dog housing, so that you're not walking um, a really, you know, hyper-aroused animal across 10, 10 cages, right, 10 kennels. So multiple areas of exit are a good idea. Um, and I'll, we'll talk about this more, but providing some type of barrier, optional barrier, 
Um, if the animal doesn't want to constantly be looking at the dog across the, the um, way from it, if it does, then it does. If it not, then it might be able to hide. Uh, I'll, just, I'll add on to that. This, we talk about providing a hiding place for cats, and I think we really need to make sure that we ensure dogs yeah. also have, I like to call it a place for retreat, where they can get out of either the view of other dogs or move to the other side of a double compartment housing unit um, and kind of get away from things if they, if they feel the desire to do that. So I think um, we don't think about that as much with dogs, but we certainly see um, the need for that in dogs too, and there's different ways we can provide for that. Yeah, so. Dr. Wagner actually had, I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of it, but she had a photo of it from her lecture, um, I believe of Marin Humane. If you oh, yep, yep. And so they have this really neat thing where they have removable uh, frosted panes. So they can put it on if they think the dog needs it. They can kind of insert it in front of the dog's door, the kennel's door, and they can remove it or they can just put it on one side because it's kind of, there, it's a, there, there's width enough that they can have two panes. So um, it's just flexible. So housing or noise technique, uh, noise reduction. Um, and I mentioned that plexiglass housing or the plexiglass doors, which is nice because it contains noise, but um, but it's often difficult to interact with the animals that way. And so uh, this was really interesting to me. I was recently at NABC and Dr. Margaret Slater was speaking about some of ASPCA's research on adoptability and what what client, what uh, adopters are coming in and. What, their adopt, what, what are adoptions based on? And so, markedly, most of it is appearance of an animal, kittens, puppies, appearance. That, that's probably the biggest issue, factor there. But they noticed, their research noticed that, particularly for adult cats, like there, there might not be much that's distinctive, perhaps, about the cat. They're, they might not you know, have anything obvious that sets them apart. And so what this research noted is that um, how affiliative they were with the adopters is what, what was the second most important factor, especially for this group of animals. And so, you know, I, the, plex, the, the housing is, I think, aesthetically nice. It, it um, lets you see the animal really nicely, but it does limit that adoption, or adopter animal interaction, which we know is important. So it's, it's nice, I mean, I think it is nice when an animal in, wants to interact with you. Go for it. So I, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have shelters that have the plexiglass cages, like Dr. Newberry says, the hermetically sealed cats, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they can't, you know, remodel, do you ever see people just like drilling holes in them so that the cats can stick their claws out? Uh, whoa, how, how, like how big of holes? <laughs> well, we actually, well, well, we've suggested actually, it to Not the big cage. enough for the cats to like jump out. We've Absolutely. suggested it to the cage manufacturers, um, and there was, I, there was one who's like, thought about it, Mason, they thought about it a few times, and we've never gotten to actually go through it. But we, we actually love the idea so that they can reach through and that air comes in, and um, it's all a question of, you know, what size and whether anybody's head gets stuck, and so they don't have to be that big. <laughs> the, thing that, the thing that you see all the time is if you go to those shelters that have, like, the glass doors, and they put, like, Three holes in like, the bottom. Right. Like, that's actually going to ventilate that room. Yeah, like they, these ones have like they just, little holes in the bottom. Those have like a little line of holes, but sometimes in the rooms, uh, Wisconsin Humane has those. Oh, where yeah, they just yeah. have like three or four holes in the bottom. And you see the cats like I know. Those little holes and they like, like stay out their nose in, in those little holes because they're just trying to like interact with somebody. So I love that idea of those holes. I actually think it would look really neat too to have those yeah. kind of polka dots. And when I was trying to convince Mason, I was trying to convince him to use different sides. Because mm -hmm. it would look oh, really neat. Look pretty neat, yeah. Uh, the other thing, I mean, I'm way... So there's some aesthetic nice to look through a glass or plexiglass right. area. And just go ahead and leave the upper plexiglass. If they're ventilated well enough, there's another issue with completely enclosing the cages is ventilation issues. And th these must be... Um, ventilated when you've got them plexiglassed in. There's no way enough air is going to come in through these little holes to, for good ventilation in there. So air quality is a big concern when, when I start seeing things enclosed. But in, for cats, though, you could um, just have an upper part that's clear so people can look through an adoption and then have a lower part that's m maybe um, bars or something. Then there's other things that manufacturers are working with that look less um, bar-like. 
um, that can be used on the lower and still allow it interaction. But and plexiglass is pretty easy to cut, so the do-it-yourselfers can to, can work with plexiglass. It does sometimes it does um, shatter though, so um, um, so I'd be a little bit careful about just ripping them off, and cutting them off. But um, yeah, there's a there's there's opportunity there. Even the glass ones, you can have someone come in and cut the glass, and you can cut holes in those too. So. And also, an important note here, and Dr. Wagner discussed this too, is um, you know, encouraging people to act, interact with the animals um, instead of kind of, you know, we, I've certainly been to shelters where they've had big signs that say, do not touch the animals. You know? And think of it again, you know, think of it as um, um, if you went to a store or if you went to buy something, and you actually weren't ever allowed to touch it, uh, which would be weird, or never try it on, or never see how it fit you. And so, um, and we know, you know, research is, uh, some of our research has shown that it's it's really the staff and it's really us that's really carrying that, that that's propagating that infectious dose concept, um, not necessarily the potential adopters. So encourage adopters to try to interact with the animals. One of the things um, to add to what Dr. Ragnar was saying about having those cages sealed up too is that you'll see there's kind of a fad of this um, yeah. positive pressure of ventilation to have the, the ventilation be pulling out of the back of the cage units. And so um, one of the things they say is that they have to be sealed on the front so that that pull will be effective to pull um, the air mm -hmm. through. And um, that's really where the hermetic comes from, but really, like, I've never, ever seen one of those where when you stick your head in there, it's not just the worst, foulest, stale air. Um, yeah, this, this is an area, ventilation of the individual housing units um, is probably one of the poorest, um, we see some of the, the need for the, uh, for design changes. <laughs> <laughs> Needs a big change, yeah, and I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what the issue is, but uh, some of, there's a lot of cost that's associated with individually ventilating each unit, and then if it is not effective, um, it really leaves you with a really tough environment. And it really came, I think, from what, what Tomki's saying about this idea that you need to seal these cats up and keep them safe yeah. when the danger that that they're really presented to primarily is stress and not exposure, right? And then um, even if it was exposure, it's not from the people that the shelter is afraid of, it's, it's from them themselves. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then I put some additional pictures. This is San Francisco SPCA. This is uh, Berkeley Humane. Um, and this is an interactive cat room, and this is a really nice indoor-outdoor uh, interactive dog room. And so it's nice because people can take them out, um, volunteers can take them out. Uh, but what's also nice here is that um, there are two dogs here, but they weren't going crazy, like they weren't playing that much. And what, the, what two of these volunteers were doing here was um, just kind of petting and interacting with the animal in a quiet, in calm way as well. Did you notice that when we were there? I, I did not. So one of the dogs was running around, but the other one was being pet and being, um, just being positively reinforced to, to be kind of relaxed. And uh, that's a good, that we, da, um, Sue Sternberg has talked about this, and it's called uh, the, what is it called? Like the do nothing exercise, right? And it's literally, uh, I'm sitting here, I'm a volunteer, and I have a dog in front of me, um, maybe on a leash, and it's just laying down quietly on a towel or a mat, and I'm petting it and giving it treats just for, just for that, for nothing else, just for being calm and quiet. Um, because we've noticed that uh, adopters do like, they love when animals are affiliative, but they also like when you take them into a room, a meet and greet room, and they can be calm, and they can, um, go to a mat and lay down, or go to a bed and lay down, or say you take <coughs> home a dog and it might be a little stressed, but it sees a bed or it sees a towel and it knows that it can maybe feel secure and calm in that spot. So some positive um, reinforcement for being quiet and calm as well is also important. Uh, 
I put these photos in for natural lighting and outdoor space. Uh, that's a cat room in um, Austin, Texas's municipal shelter. Uh, this is in California at Sutter County Shelter. And a lot of the dogs are just laying like that in the sunlight, in these beautiful rays of um, sun. And the benefits for providing natural light and outdoor space for cats and dogs, um, stress reduction, natural ventilation, etc. Better air quality. Uh, and we've talked about this, so um, just, to, just as to touch on it, uh, single compartment housing uh, compared to double compartment housing. And what I was going to, you know, mention here are what are some of the really obvious issues that are going on. For instance, in the cat picture, like just some really overt issues. I think so. Um, but it, like none of those cats, yeah, uh, none of those cats really fit is one issue. Um, and then what about here in the, this dog housing? Because this is, I believe, dog adoption in this shelter. That's interesting <coughs> to me. Is that two-story dog housing? Yeah. It is. That's yeah, it is. I had not seen that prior to this visit, and I was uh, a bit like I was bog mind boggled by that one. It's lovely when you clean it. Right. So, um, I mean, really, you know, really overt implications here for welfare, stress, um, inability to express natural behavior, uh, food. There definitely not the proper triangulation distance between food and litter box, um, and sleeping here. Uh, I don't even know what they were doing for cleaning here. I'm not sure how they were cleaning this area, but yeah. And to contrast, um, and to emphasize what Dr. Wagner spoke about at length this morning, or this afternoon, uh, double-sided housing. And I put this picture up, even though you don't see a dog, there's a dog in there, uh, but it's defecated in this side of its kennel, and it's kept its housing unit nice and clean and then this nice cat can go in between. Um, and not only does it have space, but it also has a hide box if it wants to hide. Uh, so again, thinking of those five freedoms and how they are uh, manifested here through adequate housing. And then uh, we talked a little bit about group housing. This is at a shelter in California as well, Placer SPCA where um, they put adult cats that are um, not on their fast track, so some slower cats that need, uh, slow track cats that need potentially longer term housing, they put the right, uh, the appropriate amount of cats in here with a lot of vertical space, enough litter boxes. And then these dogs um, came in, I believe, as a pair, so housing them pro appropriately together. Pictures are so sad, I'm sorry. Um, but it, you know, we've touched upon this as well, just clearly just not enough space, really stressed, um, thinking of the five freedoms, all, of course, and what, what the implications are here. And so I put these pictures up to sh highlight in the next few slides uh, different techniques to mitigate those issues. So hiding, Dr. Wagner earlier spoke about her curtail idea, which I love the name. Wait for someone with, with their sewing machine. Sewing right? machine. You got the, okay. um, but giving them options. So giving them options. If they want to hide, they can. If they want to um, be affiliative at the front of their cage, they can. Uh, another option is maybe you just, you're, you're, you're dealing with a facility that you just can't do double-sided housing for dogs. So a um, practical solution is providing a crate within the cage. And then for, this cat doesn't look like it's feral, but uh, it looks pretty good, but it's hiding in its feral box or just relaxing in its feral box. And then I like, uh, I like these pictures too for maximizing floor space. So this, this kitty doesn't have much space to do anything. Um, and uh, 
one of the projects we do with our Shelter Medicine Club at UC Davis is uh, build these elevated beds for shelters and then we distribute them to shelters that need them and um, this certainly elevates or this certainly maximizes space there. Other concepts are um, elevating food and water so they're not taking up uh, floor space um, and that also can prevent like tipping of water and everything getting wet or contaminated. Uh, this one, so we're actually um, just one or two slides away from the end, but I wanted to put this in uh, because this was a shelter we went to in Mendocino County in California, and uh, they actually would house puppies out here. And so I, I just wanted to um, get some of your thoughts on what could be concerns with this housing for puppies, just general ideas. Yeah because of the material and how it is. And so, uh, again, this wasn't what we were there to discuss, but we certainly talked about it with them and um, um, ways they could mitigate that. Dr. Carson had mentioned putting up, um, they, couldn't, they couldn't renovate and they couldn't retrofit at that time, but potentially putting up um, boarding to, to make at least, maybe she had a recommendation was like six foot high so that it's easily disinfectable, non-porous, can be cleaned properly. Uh, and oh, I apologize for the next photo because I realize it's the last, the second to last photo, and it's a rather stark photo, but just to press the point that we don't, in any conditions and under any circumstances, um, want these types of conditions. So. Um, just because you're a shelter or just because you're a nonprofit 501c3, that doesn't mean you can hoard animals. And we don't want to hoard animals. And so it's always important to keep that in mind <laughs> wherever you go. Um, and, you know, I've put here any concerns identified, which I'm sure we could talk about this at length again. But just to reinforce that idea that how important capacity is. And capacity is not just the arbitrary number of cages your shelter was built in or the arbitrary spaces that you can put cages into. You know, it's much more than that. I do have a very lovely and sweet photo for the last one. Though. Uh, this is not a mirror. These are two <laughs> cats sitting across from each other in a portal um, cage. So, But I really appreciate everyone um, taking the time to come out. Does anyone have any questions? You, it's been Really great. I'm so grateful you were so interactive. Yes? So, um, when we do food risks, how much input does the shelter's veterinary have when we'll see the admins students who probably don't have animal health backgrounds? Yeah. Well, um, I, we, so I've been to shelters where um, kind of the opposite has happened. They didn't really have um, a shelter vet on board, so they asked a private practitioner in the community to help. And that, uh, how do I put this, turned out a little disastrous. Uh, so I think it depends, but what have you yeah. had experience with? Uh, it, it depends, but um, wh I've also um, spoke with, uh, with uh, architects where there is a veterinarian on the board, um, which can be very uh, that's not necessarily a shelter veterinarian, just a veterinarian in the community, um, which doesn't have, uh, which in some cases hasn't had too much uh, background as a shelter veterinarian, and with similar um, outcome uh, for design. And I think this is really critical in um, in the design process. Is uh, we can have. Uh, uh, Architects that don't have as very much experience in mm -hmm. building facilities, um, and we have, we can have architects that have a great amount of experience um, with facilities. And we can also have veterinarians who are um, sharing information um, that may not uh, relate to what that facility is going to need to do, and so. <clears throat> Having um, experienced people in there working with shelter veterinarians um, can be really critical to design. It's hard to uh, reach out 
to a, a facility or a group or, or, or shelter with information, it often we need to rely on them coming to us. So sometimes sharing good information isn't always welcome, but I wouldn't say you shouldn't try. Um, if, you have, if you're in a community and they're building a new shelter, either sharing information with them or giving them contacts um, for people that have the resources um, for design and consultation. And <clears throat> more, um, more recently, we're seeing a, a lot more interest from architects. Initially, when we started out consulting, which was not that long ago, it was three, three, four years ago, we started understanding the impact how we would go into shelter facilities and the design of the facility was such that everything we could do management-wise didn't solve the underlying kind of structure issues that we would run into. And, and it's really been um, rewarding to be able to start more at the base, get the facility designed properly, and then allow it to work and function as, as we would like to see. Um, um, so just providing facilities with uh, resources sometimes is, is the best we can do. We don't always get asked for input, even though we like to give it sometimes. And so sort of sorting through that, depending on what, what's going on. Um, I think the, our best case, most fun consultations for design involve someone telling us that they're thinking about starting a new facility and they want our input from the very beginning. Yes. And we talk to them, sometimes we even help them figure out which architect they want to use. Otherwise, we talk with their architect or we talk with the shelter and, and make a plan um, from the very beginning and, and we work through all the ideas and everything, all the design together and that's... Really, almost before anything goes on to a piece of paper, because once we talk... And it's so fun. And it's <laughs> fun and you throw ideas back and forth and share like reasons for wanting so certain things certain ways and um, and then let them hit the drawing board with that. And we learn from we, architects. Like what's architect feasible and what's doable yeah. and like there's no way you can do that or oh, that's a great idea, that is that is possible. And sometimes they, the architects even take whatever idea we have a step further and, and that's super, super fun. The downside of that is the shelter comes to us with plans that they've already worked on for a year or two years and the they architects love already it. designed them and the architect yeah. has only a little bit of money left in their contract and we come in and we look at the plans and really we want them to redesign everything and they've built half as many dog rooms as really they need and twice as many cat housing units as they really need and um, everything's in the wrong place and the architects hate us um, and that can be really, really hard. Um, because some shelters, like, based on the structures, not really that feasible to ask them that you have six inches of concrete for your dog cages, you can't really say make a hole. It just seems really difficult for us to start off making the proper structure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, it just depends. But anytime we can work really collaboratively with the architects and the shelters as they're putting everything. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a it's a, a lot of fun, and it's um, yeah. thing we can share information with them, and they can share information mm -hmm. with us. It's um, it's it's really fun. We recently went to um, into the Bay Area and in, in near San Francisco and Berkeley, and met with uh, one of the kind of the prominent um, shelter architects right now, George Myers, and we went to his firm, and he. Uh, took a lot of time one evening with us just to talk and discuss different ideas and one of the things he mentioned is that s some of these shelters take years right like from the minute they, they contacted them and to blueprint, blueprints to the actual building and that he said that one of the challenges is the people who initially um, helped him design and contributed ideas those aren't even the people that are on the board anymore yeah by the time it's later. built it's a whole new group of people right. Who don't understand, have, didn't have input in the shelter, don't really understand that how it was designed, you know, right. with the design interests of the initial group of people, and so there can be challenges, really real challenges. So it's certainly just because nice. of the process so long. 
Yeah, so it's certainly nice to provide this collaborative effort and have a third party um, provide recommendations early on. The other piece of it that is something that was really um, new to me when we started really delving into these design consults is the way that a lot of the shelters work is in order for them to raise money for a building, um, they need to have plans to show people. They need something to show people. So often they want to rush through the early phases of design so they can get a book, you know, that they can show people the pictures of what it will look like um, to show people. But if they rush through that, then, you know, when they go back to it, they're stuck to some extent with what they said they were going to do. And then it can be difficult again. So um, just understanding all the different phases of that whole design yeah, process. it's been a whole learning process. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole another uh, big wide world. Like the uh, architect came the other day to Davis, and they're they're bidding on a design that's already been created, and that they're, they're looking for bids from. Is that correct? They're looking for bids from architectural firms to build. Yeah, so just design build. Just the way. It's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anything about learning animals. Do you find that shelters have different needs for housing horses and stuff that are beyond like a barn? Do you have special challenges that you have to deal with there? Uh, you know, I've been. I'm from Texas originally, and uh, the first time I went to see the Houston SPCA, I was. I was like, wow, this place is really crazy because they have horses, they have donkey, they have all these animals. Uh, they have or like ornamental longhorns that people would just keep in their front lawns and then the economy tanks, so they can't take care of them anymore, so they just go drop them off at the shelter. Um, but for instance, Houston SPCA, Houston is fortunate in that we have so much space in Houston. And so at Houston SPCA, they have, yeah, not just, um, barns for horses, but they have to um, really think of all of these potential farm animals that could come to them, and they try to um, provide appropriate housing for them. I think that's a, a great question, though, and we find a lot of, um, and this goes back to really having the facility to house these animals, and you do, a, a, you know, you can't take in 50 head of cattle that aren't properly cared for, most shelter facilities do not have the housing for that. And we've seen some, some um, situations occur. Um, this was uh, probably 15 years ago in, in, uh, in Marin County where the local shelter took in a herd of goats um, that were, it was uh, during uh, kidding time and they were happened to be aborting and none of the staff really understood the implications of um, the potential zoonot the zoonotic potential of having sick goats and so they not only had goats with illness they had people with illness um, because of that too so the the thought that um, a facility facility can be um, ha some of the uh, the thought that a facility can flex to take care of every possible situation is really impossible. And so um, designing for what's probably most common and really gearing that facility to take care of what's most common and then taking care of those rare instances in finding other methods to take care of those rare instances where maybe we, it would be better to house in place with care um, if that's feasible. Just really op opening up options for finding solution for problems that probably bringing in these either groups of animals or and tends to be um, accentuated when we have a lar large animal and large numbers of large animal that we just don't have the facilities for kind of in our routine animal sheltering sort of situation so solving those problems uniquely um, I think is it may be some other ways to approach some of those issues. One of the, the really important issues with this too is the contract and a lot of shelters don't think about it beforehand and then they do afterwards. Yeah. Um, to really be sure that what you've agreed to do mm -hmm. in the contract that you sign with whatever animal control agency is something that you can actually do. I don't know if you guys know, I mean, Dane County who makes it, they ended up with an orangutan um, oh. in the shelter. And you know, the animal control called to say we're gonna bring the orangutan 
and everybody said, well, we don't have to take that. And when they looked at their contract, yes, actually, they did have to take it. And um, so those are important things to think about when you're signing a contract to make sure that, that you can actually do all the things that you're saying you can do and that you can do them in a humane and reasonable way. Uh, in dog run. The dog run had to be modified and they got it out as soon as they possibly could, even in a sanctuary now. We also included that they have two giant, like literally this big Amazonian fish. And I, I was the senior staff member of that day. It was Saturday. I was like the highest ranking person there. And they're like, oh, by the way, we're on our way with this fish. Where, where am I supposed to put We ended up housing them in a horse trough. I think we had them for like two months. There is an enormous snake uh, of both constrictor that came in when I was there too. And, you know, I mean, enormous had to be housed in a dog run as oh. well. Um, and uh, so these are the kinds of things that, you know, since then, you know, the contract, make sure that's something you want to agree that you're going to do. And, but also really carefully think about what alternatives there are. Always, always, always. You guys have heard me say this a million times, but like, always think about what alternatives there are to shelter and take. Yeah, that could be just, <laughs> just always. Just always. <laughs> like anytime you're thinking about shelters, think about the alternatives to sheltering. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's a good note to end. That on. is a great <laughs> note. <laughs> that is a great day. Wow. Yeah. We're great. Thank yeah, you thank you. Know. you.